Hi, welcome to Pizza Talk. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and we've got a really special episode today. I'm excited about this. I'm here with Lisa Pollock and David Gar uh, David. I, I always want to call you David because that's how it's spelled, but it's David Garcia Aguirre. Uh, at, uh, and you're both coming to us from uh, the Corto Olive Oil universe. Uh, David, I think you're out in Lodi, and Lisa, you're uh, somewhere somewhere in California, right? In Sacramento mm -hmm. somewhere. And exactly. And we're going to learn, we're going to spend the, this whole session uh, learning everything we can about not only olive oil, but sort of like the future of olive oil. I, I think this is the most exciting part to me is, is that is that you guys at Corto are doing something that is really unique and special and, and in a way revolutionary. And so I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. And uh, so let me first welcome you guys. Uh, Lisa, it's good to see you. Uh, you and great I, to you. yeah, thank you for inviting us on here. This is a couple of weeks ago, you took me through kind of a, a tasting experience with uh, you sent me one of these little tasting boxes and a kit with olive oils and and kind of uh, gave me uh, an initiation, I would say. And it was so illuminating that I felt like it would be great to share this with all of our viewers. And so, and then you invited David to join us. So, the, <laughs> they, sorry, we'll keep. I'll keep going back and forth between David and David, uh, but we, we got David here and he's going to take us. He's you're, David, why don't you introduce yourself and, and what you do? Are you like the operations manager there or what? Yeah, so my name is David uh, Garcia Geary. I'm the uh, master miller here at Cordo Olive. And what that really means is that I'm in charge of all of the oil production. And um, really my job, you know, doesn't really end until all of our customers have received the fresh, you know, high quality oil that we've made. So I'm pretty much the steward of the oil, the crafter, the maker. Sorry, my phone just went off. I, I thought I turned off all my phones. This is this is the Zoom world that we live in. <laughs> hey, we're used to it. Yeah. Working yeah. with technology, there's always variables. Right? We're all very forgiving. If Believe 2020 me. has taught us anything. We've been learning and, and it's kind of like, it's changed our whole perspective on life is that everything, it doesn't always have to be perfect. Uh, and and still be very interesting. In fact, even more interesting. So, uh, so as Master Miller, that, that's a term that we think of, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in my world, in the bread world, we think of Master Millers with, with uh, milling grain and you're milling olives to create olive oil, correct? Correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, essentially, you know, the, the, the term comes from old Spanish and Italian Maestro Molinero. Um, you know, it's a different process, obviously, to milling grain. We're uh, essentially what I do is I make fruit juice. Um, you know, instead of keeping the water phase, we keep the oil. And uh, so, you know, I guess I'm a master juice maker. <laughs> we always uh, think of olive oils as being pressed. Is pressing and milling the same thing? Uh, you know, pressing is an interesting one. So technically speaking, presses haven't been used in 30 years in olive oil. Uh, we use centrifuges now. To separate the oil from the uh, from from the rest of the uh, olives, um, and, and for good reason, the quality is a lot higher. There's no exposure to oxygen. We get a lot more aromatics and more polyphenols, and the oils are just a much higher quality when using centrifuges. So this is really the difference, in a sense, between old school and modern times is that the technology's changed, and it's not a bad thing. Technology has actually brought us a higher quality product. Yeah, that's correct. You know, we don't use donkeys on stones anymore. You know, we have more modern ways of, of making the product and it's resulting oh, in a it's pounding the uh, grapes down to <laughs> the juice, right? Uh, so, so I'm, and I, are you standing like in the, in the, uh, the mill right now? And are those vats of olive oil behind? Yeah, so I'm actually in, in our cellar and all of these are uh, stainless steel casks and they're all full of olive oil from this year's harvest. Wow. How many gallons would you say of olive oil is the typical harvest or as was was this year's harvest uh you know it, it depends so olives are alternate bearing so they'll have an on year and an off year but you know suffice it to say we've got you know oh uh, what now 80 over 80 of these casks wow we've got and, plenty of plenty of oil and and court we're, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time today talking about uh the court of company except that i think it's important for our viewers especially many of them who are in the pizza world uh, to know that that corto is uh, is a term that's connected to the name cortopasi, which and, and cortopasi family is, are the the family behind Stanislaus tomatoes. So you guys are both in the olive oil business and the tomato business. I'm guessing the tomato business came first, right? 
It did. Actually, you know, I will spend a little time talking about the family because I think it's a good, it paints a good backdrop as for what's happening in the olive oil industry. So, you know, Cordo uh, obviously is a uh, own, you know, was founded by the Cordo Posse found family about 15 years ago. And the Cordo Posse is our multi-generational farming family. It came from Lucca, Italy. I think Amerigo uh, came over in the 20s. And his son, Dino, uh, Dino Cordo Posse is really the the enigma and the driving force behind the success that uh, Stanislaus Food Products has had and now Cordo is having. And really what set Dino apart was, you know, many things, but two in particular, I think that are pretty relevant now. N you know, number one, Dino has always believed that, you know, in order to have a successful company, you have to have a demonstrably better product. And that means that take whatever else is out there, you know, whether it's tomatoes, whether it's olive oil, and your product has to be better because at the end of the day, people continue, they'll keep coming back to the high quality products. And the other part of that is Dino was always willing, even more than willing, he was always eager to find innovations, you know, innovative ways that not only make you more efficient, but also continue to widen that gap in quality. And, you know, in tomatoes, that was, you know, an example would be like the, he was one of the first adopters of a, the tomato harvester, the automated tomato harvester. And obviously when it first started, it, it wasn't perfect. You know, there were a lot of challenges, but at the end of the day, you realize that not only can you get a lot more tomatoes out of the ground, you can also get them to the cannery faster. So the overall quality is a lot better. And we, um, he, he saw the exact same opportunity here with olive oil and this new method of planting, which we'll get into, which uh, is really revolutionizing the olive oil industry. It's the first time, I like to say it's the first time in olive oil history that we're able to get fresh, high quality, fall harvested oils into the marketplace at any kind of scale. Yeah, I think this is, what's exciting is I think a lot of people who are watching uh, may be like I was when I first, you know, kind of started talking with you guys, thinking of olive groves as being these tall trees with, you know, uh, uh, branches drooping down, loaded with dark olives, you know, um, purple olives that are ready to fall off and be harvested. And that is like maybe the way it was a couple hundred years ago, but it's not the way it is now. And and now we've got a whole new, this, this looks almost like a vineyard is what I'm saying. It's like a vineyard, vineyard olive groves and, and they look more like bushes than like trees. Uh, so uh, I know you're going to explain all this to me, and, I, and I'm glad that we have this visual up here that people can see. Um, but going back to what you were saying about the, the the business and the family, the ethos of this company really is it's all about trying to get deliver highest quality. It sounds like is really what's driving the the vision of the company. Yeah, no, that that's exactly right. You know, and and, and I keep saying demonstrable difference because those are Dino's words, but it really is. It, it's a you know, it's, it's a push to always deliver the highest quality that's available in the marketplace. And, and, you know, and as you see here, or as you alluded to, these vineyard style of planting um, is giving us a, not just Cordo, it's giving the, the olive oil industry a, a, you know, a huge competitive advantage in that we're able to produce high quality oils now that were never available before. And, and, and this is the, I think maybe the crux of the whole thing is, is why is this a better quality oil? And it has totally to do with when those olives are picked and how and, and the shape that they're in when they're picked, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I like to start with a story. Um, and it's, it's you can pick your favorite fruit. You know, you can use a peach, you can use an orange, but we'll, we'll use an orange for this one. So, you know, imagine an orange in your backyard and you have an orange tree in your backyard and it's, it's you go through the harvest season and you watch that orange grow from a little orange to the point when it's it's at the at that perfect moment of ripening right and you go out there and you pull that orange off the tree and you juice that orange that orange juice is going to be amazing right and, and, and yeah and, 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 when it's tree ripened yeah yeah, exactly. So you're pulling it straight off the tree at the perfect time and, and you can that juice is going to be amazing. Or if it's a peach and you bite into that peach, it's going to be incredible. Now you can let that orange hang on the tree for another three, four, five months. And that orange is going to continue on its ripening process, right? For all the, the geeks out there, all the enzymes start breaking the orange down. Eventually those enzymes start you know, the, the, it starts undergoing fermentations and you start, that orange starts turning black and then it starts to essentially rot on the tree. And at that moment when it's about to drop, you can still pick that orange and make, and make juice out of it. 
right? But that orange juice, you can imagine what it would taste like. And unfortunately for all of us that love food, the vast majority of olive oil that's available in the United States comes from fruit that's way overripe like that orange. Exactly. So overripeness is, is as big a problem as underripeness in, that's in, correct. in fruit. I mean, I, I had a peach tree in my backyard when I first moved to North Carolina. It was one peach tree and I love that tree until uh, uh, a landscaper one day inadvertently, you know, ruined it and cut it down. But it, it gave me maybe 12 peaches a year and I, and I wouldn't I just wanted to wait till the perfect moment to pick it. And, and, and it was a different kind of peach when you picked it that way than if you picked it early or if you waited too long. Yeah, that's right. And that time in olives is in, it's in the fall. It's in October and November. Um, the antioxidant levels are the highest in the fall. Um, the aromas and the, uh, you know, the, the, the flavors that you get are all reminiscent of fresh green, uh, you know, uh, uh, fruits and, and, herbs and things like that. And, and the reality is all premium oils are harvested in the fall. The challenge has always been there's, there isn't, there hasn't been until now a way to harvest the fruit in a way that we can get enough olives off the tree to make enough oil to meet the, you know, the demand for high quality oil. And, uh, you know, you've been, uh, I mean, those of you who are not actually seeing what we're doing, but listening to it as a podcast, uh, aren't seeing what I'm seeing on the screen, which is uh, a, a graphic that, that has uh, maybe seven, uh, an olive at seven different stages of its growth. And prior to that, we were looking at, at the, the uh, what would you call it, the vineyard, so to speak, or the, the orchard in which these, these olive groves were, were planted, which were row after row, straight long rows uh, of, of olive, are they trees, or, uh, David, are these trees? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're trees. They're trees and they're just planted on, on, they're planted in basically in hedgerows on trellises, just like we plant wine grapes. Hedgerows, I guess that's the word I was looking for. So, so, and, and acre after acre after acre of these, and then, but then the olives themselves, I'm looking at a, at a, at a photo now where there's uh, an olive that's very bright green. It's sort of, I would say my first impression would be, it's not right. It's not ready. Then there's one that's starting to get a little bit of color. And then there's one that's more, it's, it's some more purples coming in, one that's almost, you know, mostly purple. Then there's one that's all purple. I mean, it's, and then there's, then it's going to black. And then finally at the end, it's wrinkled like a prune. So those like different stages. Where are olives usually picked, uh, you know, sort of in the old, an old school and where are you picking them? So I, you know, the vast majority of olives, more than 70%, probably even closer to 80%, are harvested after January, which would put it at the last two ripening stages in the graphic. So, you know, the reality is October, November, maybe the first few weeks of December are the ideal point to harvest olives. That's when, like I said, the antioxidant levels are the highest. That's when you make premium oils. When you start getting beyond that, you start losing, uh, the antioxidants drop off quickly. The fermentation starts, so you can actually start getting defects in the oil. And you get to a point eventually where you can't even make extra virgin oil uh, from those olives. So the olive that you that the graphic says is the is the time when you pick them is the second the second olive on this on this lineage. The, from the first one's very bright green. This one is just starting to show a little bit of color, and then the next one after that gets more colorful. So it's the one that's just getting color. That's when you grab them. Huh? Yeah, we like to say it's green to violet. <laughs> and, and in the graphic, it also says that when 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 most you know old school companies harvest, it's it's when the olive is much more purple or dark purple almost. And I yeah. guess that's because it's it's easier to get them off the trees, right? That's right. Yeah. So you know, actually, do you mind if I take a step back and kind of explain what makes olive oil different and why this is important? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think the context and, and the backdrop here is really important because, I, you know, there, I think the, 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 the problem is olive oil traditionally has been lumped into the edible oil category. It's just been it's been treated like a fat. And if we continue to use that kind of uh, framework to contextualize what olive oil actually is, we're never really going to understand and appreciate what, what high quality olive oil is. And you know, olive oil, what makes it different than everything else is that olive oil is essentially a juiced fruit. Right? Every other kind of oil out there, I don't care if it's soybean, canola, grapeseed, nut oils, whatever it is, it goes through a refining process. And the refining process strips away any 
flavor, any aroma, any color, and it just ends up as a colorless, odorless fat, basically. Fat. Yeah. Olive oil is the exact opposite of that. So olive oil is actually a celebration of the fruit itself. So, you know, the better the fruit, the better the quality of the oil. And, and you know, and we'll talk more about storing oil and the freshness of the oil, because that's the other part of this equation. But for right now, we have to understand that olive oil is juiced fruit, and that's what uh makes it special. How much of the oil is in the fruit part and how much is in the seed uh, or is, uh, and, and, and is there, you know, an, an issue there in terms of the quality? No, almost all of the oil is in the fruit. It's in the flesh. Mm. There's very little, very little in the pit itself. Okay. So, we're, so, so as opposed, and how much of that uh, is juice versus oil? Oh, good question. So it's about, I, I'd say in olives about 18 to 20 percent oil and about 50 percent water and and does that water have to get somehow dealt with it doesn't go into the final product right that's right yeah that's what the the centrifuges or the old days it used to be the presses the presses would press out the the water and the oil and then you'd let it settle and they'd naturally separate today uh, uh, we use centrifuges that separate the the uh, water and the oil so that way the the oil goes straight into its own tank and what happens to the to the juices? Uh, well, currently, so once the oil is extracted, once the oil is pulled out, it's called pomace. And currently, at least in California, uh, the pomace is mostly going to compost, animal feed. But there's a lot of untapped value in the pomace, and and you know it's such a it's such a new industry, the the world of high quality oil at scale that we're just starting to scratch the surface there. I know that people are doing the same thing with grapeseed pomace. And, and grape pumice uh, and, and finding other uses, both uh, uh, pharma, pharmacologically, uh, cosmetically, all sorts of other benefits, because those antioxidants are still in the pumice too, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, we always talk about the antioxidants in the oil and the oil does have antioxidants, but the vast majority of antioxidants are in the water. Ah, uh, that's interesting. So yeah. yeah, so we've got two distinct products then. Uh, yeah. But well, you know, this is pretty fascinating stuff because again, uh, we take it for granted. We use olive oil. We use any kind of oil. We don't really think about where it comes from. We just know that we like this one better than that one. Uh, we know that maybe, well, we should talk a little bit maybe in a bit about the type of olives themselves and what, what factor that has in the flavor. Uh, but, and because ultimately what you're talking about is delivering a highest quality flavor uh, components to this functional food, which is oil. Yeah, I think that's that's what's so exciting. We we like to say around here that olive oil is that it's the ingredient that farm to table forgot. Interesting, right? because, we, because you, you you can go you go to any restaurant and they can tell you about every ingredient on that menu, right? They'll tell you about the the proteins, the micro herbs, whatever it is they're using, and then you ask them about the oils and they don't have a clue. You just get this like look on your face, like on their face, like wow, I have no idea. I've never even thought about that. Right, right. And so our big thing is we want to close the loop on that because it olive oil touches more ingredients in a dish than almost any any other ingredient in there, uh -huh. and yet you know and yet we 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 don't we don't pay it the service and we don't use it in the right way yet, and I think once we can start conceptualizing it as you know a juice that retains all the the flavors and aromas and everything from the fruit. And then we can start talking about different varietals and things that opens a whole new world for chefs and for, you know, artisan homemaker chefs. And, and it, it, it basically, you know, it's a new tool that we're just starting to scratch the surface with. We can get as specific with that as we can with grapes and with cheeses and things like that. Exactly. Yep. The nuance factor comes in. Well, listen, why don't we do this? Let's take a little break right now. Cause I want, I want, I have a lot more questions I want to ask you and I want to learn as much as I can from while you, and well, maybe we'll bring it in the next segment. We'll bring Lisa back in and we'll talk about um, not only the farming techniques, but these flavor components. And then of course, ultimately I want uh, Lisa to kind of walk me through a tasting, uh, you know, for the benefit of everybody who's watching. So we can actually, you know, get those flavors in our mouth and describe them and talk about them. So uh, David, we'll, we'll, we'll and all of you hang in there for a second, come back for the next part. We're going to continue on this. I will call it our, our primer, our primer of, uh, of olive oil, everything you want to know about olive oil. And uh, we're going to continue the discussion in just a moment. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and I'm here with Lisa Pollock and David Garcia Aguirre uh, from Corto Olive Oil. 
and uh, we're going to continue because we've had a, a fascinating sort of first round on this, and and it's just got my wheels spinning. I've got so many questions for you guys. Uh, David's been giving us sort of a crash course in the the process of milling as opposed to pressing olive oil, and in a sense, these are examples of the different understandings that we have of how you what olive oil actually is. So, David, David, you were talking about the uh, the fact that that olive oil really is the juice from a from a fruit is an olive a fruit when you say it's a fruit yeah no, that's, that's a good place to start so olives are fruit surprise you know a lot of us never really conceived of it in that way but yeah so olives are a fruit and uh you know technically speaking olive oil isn't juice i guess because juices are you know water but the for a context for how to think about olive oil it works perfectly yeah, yeah, we're essentially we separate the, the juice from the oil, oil. Uh, afterwards, but but it's juiced from the olive, so to speak. That's and, that's, and and how do you do that juicing? What's the process of you? You said it's it's not being pressed the way we used to think of. Like I think of making apple cider, you know, or apple juice, you know, from by pressing apples and squeezing out the juice. But this is different. Well, how do you do it? Yeah, so you know, it, it's a relatively simple process. Um, all we do is the you know we harvest the fruit. We rush it to the mill as fast as possible because the, uh, you know, the time between milling and harvest is a big factor in quality. Then we crush the olives whole. So we, we pit and everything. We crush them into a paste, kind of like a tapenade. And then we slowly mix that paste for about 20 to 30 minutes. And that allows all the oil droplets to come together. And then we send it into a centrifuge. And that centrifuge separates the oil from everything else. And at that moment, you have the freshest oil possible. So, so you crush it. Now, how do you do the crushing? What, what, what crushes the, the olives? Uh, there, are, there are different methods. Um, typically, you know, most mills use what's called a hammer mill or a blade crusher. And they, they literally, you know, they're like little hammers that are cutting it down into small bits. So and I, again, I, my analogy for this is always the, the bread world and the grain world. So the and hammer milling is an actual type of milling that you use. Yep. And bread making and, and flour yep. production too. So, um, uh, so, but to get the olives, so you've got olives growing in these these incredible uh, orchards of of olive trees that have been sort of cut to. Uh, I, I don't know. I think of it as like the like these little Japanese trees, you know, so to speak. You, you know, but it, but because you're keeping them small, uh, and they're growing. The fruits growing all over the plant, right? And, and all on the new growth, whatever new growth that's this right. year, that's where the fruit's gonna happen. And then how do you get them off the, the, uh, the vines? So the, so yeah, so the olives grow on last year's wood. So every, you know, we're, we're like a year behind with the fruit. So the, they're grown in hedgerows on trellises and they're really close together. They're like three, three and a half feet apart, the trees are. And they grow into each other to form a hedge. Um, basically what we've done, what the innovation was, and, and I shouldn't say we, we didn't invent it, but we have adopted it. Um, the, what, what has happened is we've taken a grape harvester, same exact concept, but we've made it bigger. So the, the harvester will drive over the top of the row and inside there are little gentle picking fingers, we call them, but they shake back and forth and they strip the, uh, the fruit off of the tree. It's, it's amazing. And then that fruit goes, it's cleaned up and you're then, able to and do this to and get them off the tree at an earlier stage than than old school because the the, yep. the method itself gets them uh you're not just shaking the tree you're actually kind of uh separating the the, the fruit from the branches uh and lisa you had uh i think mentioned something about um uh, uh again the, this sort of difference uh the, you know this different approach from I'll, I'll just call it new school versus old school uh, when did all this sort of change? When did, when did the paradigm flip? Yeah, no, good question. I mean, so when we're talking about kind of this new planting style, you can kind of think about it as like, this is something that's taken off in California as like the new world where it's kind of like, we now have a way to mechanically harvest this fruit in the fall. Because the biggest difference is that when we were talking in the last segment about like, you know, the scale of the life cycle of how that fruit kind of develops and its flavor and be eventually becomes overripe. 
where you get the best quality out of the olive fruit that translates into the oil is when you harvest that fruit in the fall when it's green and kind of just starting to turn to like this blush violet. And so the harvesting at that point is a little bit more complicated because it takes more force to remove the fruit from the actual tree. And so like in these old world producing regions, generally the trees are planted traditional style. So it's, you know, 15 to 20 feet in, de- in between each of these individual kind of larger trees. And they're not and cut can, edges, but they're just, they grow up like trees. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's possible to make a fall harvest olive oil that way, but you're going through and you're harvesting the fruit by hand or just using like these rakes and things. So it's a slow and it's laborious process. So those fall harvest olive oils kind of coming from these traditional groves are much more limited in production. And so why it's so exciting to kind of have a way using these hedgerows is that like now we have this machine that helps to assist that process of pulling them off the tree in the fall. So it's a lot faster and a lot more efficient. So what's kind of happened is that if you wait to harvest the olives until they're you know much more ripe, then the subsision layer kind of breaks down and it's a lot easier to remove that olive from the tree once it turns black and kind of starts that decomposition. And so what's happened is that, you know, in order to get through all the trees and for kind of an ease of harvest, if you wait till much later in the season, then it's possible to just kind of shake the trunk of those trees and the olives fall off. The trade-off though is... The trade-off is you lose the flavor, right? Because if you think about those olives, thinking back to kind of the peach or the orange analogy, you know, we can still bite into that peach when it's ready to fall off the tree and kind of overripe, but you're going to get all these kind of funky fermentations and flavors and things. And that's exactly what happens. It's a little counterintuitive for us when we use those fruit analogies, because we like to think of ripening them to the to the peak of of sugar development whereas in this case we're taking them early pre-sugar we're taking them when the flavor of the olive itself is at its peak of the oils in that olive is at its peak and that's earlier in the in the in the growing cycle uh and by the way you, earlier you had provided us with some great graphics of seeing the the hedgerows and seeing you know the the uh the, the even the plants in the mills but uh for people who are not able to watch this uh People can access this on your website, right? You've got a lot of great videos and 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 photos there where they can see the things we're talking about, right? How can exactly. they get to the website? Yeah. What's the best way for them to get to the website? So if you just go to it's corto c o r t o hyphen olive dot com, and then on the landing page you'll see you know check out our fall harvest, and we have a new portal with videos so you can really walk through and see all of excuse me all of this process in action, which is really cool. So I encourage everyone to kind of check that out. Great. Now, and then this is for both you and David, is that um, uh, the olives that, that are growing in those hedgerows, they, you must have made a conscious choice or the, the, the Corte Posse family, somebody, you know, made a choice of which olives to plant. And, you know, a lot of, I think, we think in the artisan world, uh, and if you, again, grape analogies, there's varietals. Is, are your olives a particular varietal or are they a blend of different kinds of olives? Or, and, and how are those choices made? Yeah, so we, we, we typically in, in this method of planting, the three dominant varietals are Arbequina, Arbasana, they're two Spanish varietals, and a Greek varietal, varietal called Koriniki. Uh, and the reason they were chosen is because they're low vigor varieties. So if you imagine in a hedgerow, you don't want the trees to get massive. So, um, so those, three, those three varieties lend themselves well to this planting method. Now that said, there are about another 10 varietals that are being um, developed uh, and tested for this method of planting. So, you know, it's a new method. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more different varietals coming into play. That should get real interesting in the future as we get specific and and blended and all these other, I mean, I, I imagine blending will become a big thing in its own right. Uh, this method that you're that you're using at Corto, the, you did like you said you didn't invent it. Where else in the world is this being used, and where was it pioneered? So it was it was pioneered. So it's been it's being pioneered around the world. So it was invented in Spain. Um, it wasn't adopted readily early on in Spain. It was mostly adopted in um, California, Australia, um, South Africa. Chile is a big adopter. 
um, and now is being uh, planted extensively in Spain and Portugal. I think the writing's on the wall. Everyone knows, sees that this is the future of olive oil. So we're starting to see a lot more of this planting um, happening around the world. And I would imagine because it's so intensively planted uh, that the yields per acre must be much higher than the old school method. Yeah, that's true. You know, we had one of our family growers once uh, made a comment that really stuck with me. And he said, uh, you know, in agriculture, it's rare that you have an opportunity that makes yields and quality better. And when, well, you, when you have that opportunity, you have to go all in. And I think this is one of those opportunities. This is really yeah. because it's very counterintuitive. Olives are very different from, from, from grapes or from even from wheat. Uh, yep. At least in your I was, I was just going to add something that that's like the most exciting part about this is like what it's really opened up is that it's opened up a way that we have fresh olive oil more available right now because it's like you know for me like I grew up on olive oil that now I recognize was not fresh at all and this concept of fresh olive oil was super foreign to me like I even kind of how I fell into the industry was working on a farm where we're harvesting the olives, which like first that was a learning because I didn't even know olives grew on trees. Then we take them into a mill and it's like, you know, there's all this buildup to taste this olive oil. I tasted it in the first sip, you know, it was peppery. It was kind of bitter. I was just confused because it was unlike any olive oil I'd ever tasted, you know? And so I think that's the most exciting part is just that like it's raising the bar because now we yeah. have more of this fresh olive oil available. Right. So it's changing chefs and home chefs, you know, changing our palates to appreciate this flavor and really kind of integrate it into the food, which is the most exciting part. Well, it is, but but I want to go back uh, to this, this facet of being able to grow more intensively and yet uh, in a, it's what sounds like in a more sustainable manner. What what are the, the benefits of this method in terms of the, the, the earth itself, you know, and and because usually when you think of intensive growing, you think about depleting the soil and you think about, you know, like, uh, you know, sucking up tons of water. You know, what are what what are some of the other differences in this method and in olives that differentiate it from all the other kind of farming that we associate with? Yeah, and a great question. You know, I think from the outset, when we saw this method of planting, we weren't thinking, you know, Cordo is going to be big. We were thinking we can establish a long-term California industry. And sustainability is a big part of that. You know, right now in California, we have over a million acres of almonds planted. And, and olives use, you know, less than half of the, of the water. And, and I think that's being generous to almonds that, um, that almonds do. They use less water than grapes even. The other really interesting thing about olives is they're evergreens, right? So they have leaves on them year round. So olives actually are a carbon sink. Uh, the IOC, which is the International Olive Oil Council, uh, released a study a couple of years ago where they found that, you know, for every two acres of olives that are planted, and they were looking at traditional. With intensive, it's even better. Um, you know, for every two acres that are planted, you're essentially absorbing, um, you know, one person's carbon footprint per a year. Interesting. So it, it, yeah, so long term, I think it's a great crop for, for California and for other parts of the world that can grow it. Are olives dependent on bee pollination? They're not. They're self-pollinating. But you know what's interesting is because we're not harvesting on the ground anymore, we're harvesting, you know, off the trees, we can actually grow native cover crops and that will help a lot of the native insect populations, you know, stabilize them and regenerate native insect you're populations. You're building the soil up at the same time that you're continuing to grow these, these uh, edges. Yep. See, I find that to be really fascinating and, and, and must, for you guys, it must be very exciting to be, to feel like you're part of something that as ancient as this is and traditional as it is, it's also like it's new world stuff. That's a great way to put it. I think, you know, we've seen waves in other food products, right? We always talk about like the third wave in coffee where we went from like a commodity product to like, you know, your Starbucks. And then now all of a sudden you have all these really awesome boutique light rope, produ light, light rose producers everywhere or beer when we went from macro to micro, you know? And I think, I think we feel like we're at the cusp of that kind of movement. And, and yeah, I think the, the coffee analogy may be much better than the fruit analogy that we talked about earlier, because it's so similar. Um, what uh, you mentioned that California is one area where it's, it's happening is, are there other companies now that are getting into the, the game and doing it the way that you're doing it 
uh, and are and what what land are they using for that? Are they, are they repurposing things that were formerly used for apples or vineyards or almonds or what? Yeah, so there are there are certainly you know there are, there are probably you know three to five you know larger companies in California, and I got to say larger in quotations because we're still a teeny tiny industry. So compared to other industries, we're all small boutique producers. But, um, but there are other producers adopting the method and most of the lands are being converted from, uh, they're either in low water use areas. You know, California has it, we have a big water challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Us. And so a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the acreage that used to be dedicated to other crops like almonds that are higher water users are being converted over. Um, and some new acreage, but most of it's been conversion thus far. And uh, we, uh, we, you mentioned some of the different varieties of olives too. Uh, which olives are you growing? Which specific ones have you chosen? So we have a uh, Arbicina, Arbisana, Coroniki, and then we have a couple trial varietals like uh, Oleana, Lechiana, um, Chiquita. <laughs> but these are all growing together or do you grow them separately and then blend them later? We typically grow them separately and blend them later. Uh, but do they grow similarly? The process is the same regardless of the, the varietal? The, they're, they're grown similarly, but they all require different, they have different requirements. And we're still, we're just starting to learn a lot of that. Like we've planted a lot of trees in places that weren't the right place, but that comes with pioneering, I guess. When I go to buy olive oil, I think of, you know, like there's some that just says olive oil. Some says, extra, some says extra virgin, some says virgin, you know, so there's all these other terminologies. But I think one varietal that I, I think it's a varietal is that we use a lot at our houses says Kalamata olive oil. Now, is that an actual olive or is that just a region of Greece or in, and are, is Greek olive oil very different from Spanish olive oil and from Italian olive oil and from American olive oil? I'm in. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so Kalamata, I believe it's both. I mean, the biggest thing with olive oil is that, you know, when we're talking about flavor, like you're exactly right, like this, idea of what kind of olive you're making the oil from really plays a role because each different kind of olive, and I wanted to give David some credit there because it's part of it's the farming of these different varietals, but a big part of that is the milling process is different kind of varietal to varietal of kind of, you know, the different tweaks that David kind of oversees in the process to bring out the best flavor of that specific variety of fruit. And so, yeah, so these different varietals will have kind of unique characteristics, but kind of before you even get to there, the biggest thing is with olive oil, which this goes back to that fruit idea is that freshness. It's like, you have to make sure that first you have the right flavors of the fruit, and then you can experience the flavors that are coming in the nuances that are coming from the varietal and things. Whereas like a Kalamata would taste different from, you know, and Arbicina olive oil. And so in part of that, I really say that like the best olive oil is the freshest olive oil because that's where, you know, you're getting 90% of that flavor. So like, depending where it's coming from, it's more just about, you know, your means to get that olive oil and how fresh it is when it gets to you. You know, how is it produced first of all? And then how fresh is it once it gets to you in your kitchen? Yeah. And the best way to know is really to taste because a lot of times we look at the label and like you were asking about extra virgin. And yeah. so extra virgin is a quality standard that's meant to denote that it's the highest quality. And so when we're talking about quality, we're thinking about flavor, but in the United States, it's just a voluntary standard. So just because we see extra virgin on a label, there's no requirement that it's undergoing the testing that needs to be done to verify that. And like the standards defined by the, the IOC that David mentioned, which has, you know, this two part testing protocol where it's you're testing part of it in a laboratory, kind of looking at the chemistry of that oil and part of it is happening with the three taste panel. And so since that's kind of unreliable, really the best way to know if we have the best flavor on any olive oil is to taste it, right? Which we're kind of getting to. We're going to get to because I'm yeah. really, you know, the more we talk about tasting now, the more I'm starting to think about these little vials I have here that I want to try. But but th th just one more thing about that extra virgin. And our, in our minds, I think we were all conditioned to believe that that meant that you're getting the first pressing and then the regular virgin olive oil is the second pressing. And then there's this, like the pure olive oil, which is the third pressing. And then there's a pumice pressing. And uh, it, But that doesn't sound like anything like what you guys are doing. All the oils pressed, it basically crushed once, spun out once. There's no layers of the first, second, third 
round of these things, right? Right, because if you think about it, like if we're thinking about that fruit and if we're harvesting a fruit when it's way overripe, we could undergo the first pressing of that super overripe fruit. And it's technically a first pressed oil, but that doesn't mean that it's extra virgin if it were to test, if that makes sense, because we have all these other fermentations and right, flavors. Right, but you're not even doing pressing right now. I mean, you're grinding. So, yeah, we're not doing that at Cordo, but just to kind of- Grinding or a second milling that takes place, is there? A second right. round milling, it's one- So round. for us, no, we're focusing on just extracting, you know, the freshest fall harvest flavor from that green fruit in the fall, right? And it's uh, more kind of in these older, kind of more traditional industries where the second pressing is happening. But just to say that like, just looking for first press on the label, that's not enough, right? Cause like this extra virgin idea is meant to kind of filter out to this higher quality, but it doesn't tell us enough that with olive oil, we really just have to rely on our senses and taste it. And we'll kind of talk through what to look for with that. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna be tasting highest quality, which whether you call it extra virgin or not, where it's, it's the equivalent. This is the, the, this would be what would, I guess could arbitrarily be called the extra virgin, uh, uh, you know, best of show kind of, you know, level. So why don't we do this? Uh, I'm excited. I think it's time to do some tasting. Unless there's anything else that I forgot to ask you or that you want to add to our conversation here, I think it's time to move into tasting. And what I think we're going to do is uh, is uh, sort of take a, a, a quick break. I'm going to cleanse my palate. I'm going to get ready. And then I'm going to have Lisa have you guide me through a whole tasting that I will do virtually for everybody else who's watching. Uh, and you can sort of uh, you know ride along for this. And, and also mention right here, before I forget, that those of you who are in the industry, who are in the business, who want to also kind of be guided the way Lisa's going to guide me through, uh, she's willing to send out kits to any of you that want to contact her, right? Yeah, please do. On our website, we're calling it virtual tasting. And so there's, if you go to that website, it's porto-olive.com and scroll to the bottom, you can sign up for a complimentary virtual tasting for chefs and restaurants, which I would love to spend more time and kind of taste more with all of these listeners one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Well, I think we're in, in such an early stage of this industry that's only going to get bigger and be, become more and more important because we're now, we, we're now kind of competing on the world stage with companies that have dominated olive oil, like Italy and Spain and Greece, that always we associate with oil. And, and, and those are all of the, only the ones we know of. Uh, but now we're going to be as as we did with grapes and as we did with cheese and as we did with everything that that we do in this continent because we have such great resources. Uh, we're going to be it's only going to get to be bigger and bigger thing, which means that we need to become more educated as consumers and, and or even if we're in the restaurant business of, of users of these products, so that we can you know continue that education process to our to our customers. So uh, anyway, it's good. It's only gonna get bigger. That's why I'm excited about it. And I feel like we're, I feel like we're kind of on the ground floor of something that's just, you know, about to. Explode. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's why I feel like I love this industry because it's, you know, it's unfolding before our eyes and you can really play a part in it because we're still this small growing industry and we're still trying things, you know, so. I mean, how can something that's been around for thousands of years be so new? It's just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I love it. Yeah. So, so let's take a break. We're going to, we're going to, I want you all to join us back for the next round. The, the, our final round here is going to be the actual tasting round. And we're going to find out what it is that differentiates the good from the great and, or the fresh from the not so fresh. All right. Exactly. So Lisa, David, thanks. Uh, all of you come back in and uh, for part three of our olive oil primer with, with Lisa and David from Corto. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right, now the most exciting part of, of our gathering with Lisa and David is, uh, is to taste the olive oil. We've been talking about olive oil. Uh, I know a lot more than, I, than when we started. Uh, I've got a little container of, of your freshest olive oil that you just sent me overnight. I've got it here. Uh, now I wanna know how do I appreciate it and know the difference between this and everything else I've been eating and assuming was pretty good over the years. Absolutely. And I mean, that's the biggest thing is we've been talking a lot about, you know, how we make this olive oil, but, you know, let's get to the kitchen and we're using the olive oil with our food and we're using it as an ingredient. And really it's like, well, how do we know if I have the right flavors in my olive oil and kind of what am I looking for? So like in our initial discussions, I'm just going to share a visual real quick here. We were talking about how the olives are actually a fruit. And so I just kind of want to reiterate that. And so I've just popped up on the screen an image of this bowl of these yeah. olives, which when we're talking oh, about- Grapes, like, these beautiful green grape-like 
Exactly. Yeah. They look a little bit different than kind of what we think of when we're you're picturing like a table olive, right? Because yeah. we talked about, you know, the time of harvest of that fruit. Thinking about when we talk about olive oil, we want to think about it as like the juice of this fruit in the sense that, you know, the flavors that we're tasting in any olive oil, they're flavors that are originating in that fruit. Uh -huh. And so when we're thinking about kind of how do we find the best flavor in olive oil, we need to really kind of focus on this idea of the freshness and the freshness kind of has two components. You know, it starts with that fruit. Whereas like when we're talking about getting the best flavor out of an olive, the time of harvest is very important. So we want to harvest the fruit when it's, you know, green, just starting to take on a little hint of violet, which is in the fall for us in California, like October, November. And so kind of with any olive oil, first we want to know that we've captured those fresh flavors from the fruit. So what you're seeing on the screen here is a Venn diagram where we have two circles. So the first circle is this fresh fruit. So that's kind of our first part. Then the other component of this freshness, because when we're talking about freshness, that really is the equation that's lending itself to the flavor and the quality. The other piece is the freshness of the oil itself, because oil you know, degrades if it's exposed to light, air, or heat. So the storage and kind of how we're protecting that olive oil is kind of the other component. So we need to kind of know if the oil that we're choosing is fresh, meaning that it first kind of captured those fresh flavors of the fruit and it's still fresh because it's been stored and protected. And how do we know if we have that is really by tasting it is the most reliable way to do that. So that's but, what when it's not fresh, I mean, the opposite of French fresh would be what rancid would rancid be sort of the, the yep. other side of the equation that we don't want to go to. That's exactly right. Like any oil, you know, when we make it, it'll be a fresh oil and we'll also have the fresh flavors if we harvested the fruit at the right time. But if it's not stored properly, I mean, I've done experiments where it's even 24 hours where, you know, I put the olive oil in a clear glass container and I put it up on my roof. You know, I have a lot of time on my hands, but I put it up on the roof, you know, and let it sit in the heat and the sun for 24 hours. Yeah. And it's shocking because like, you know, over time, the light yeah. and heat will kind of turn an oil rancid, but it can happen really, really quickly. So yeah, with, we're kind of looking for both things. With wheat, we, you know, with whole wheat, for instance, the, you know, they say you should try to use it while it's still pretty fresh, but certainly not any older than say a month or two months, but you have a little bit of buffer time before it kicks over from sort of that, that sweet, pure uh, oil. And, that, and when we say that whole wheat's gone rancid, it's because the germ or the oily part of the, of the berry has gone rancid, not the starches and not the brand itself, but the, the oil. So here we're talking about oil as the dominant thing that we're looking for, as opposed to sugars and, and right. starches, we're talking about oil. And, and right. so the rancidity factor here is can be very dramatically fast. It can be, be very, and I find that rancidity is a very mobilizing word because nobody wants to be using a rancid oil in your food and especially not in food that you're serving to others, you know? So it's worth kind of, you know, really it all starts with tasting. It's like, that's the thing that we all need to get into the habit of, which was weird to me when I first got into this industry. You know, yeah. I never poured myself a glass of olive oil to, you know, take a sip of it before, but really like, you just need to kind of get in the habit of tasting your olive oil and we'll kind of taste together to talk about what we're looking for and how we can really tell if that oil is fresh because that's where all the flavor lies. Well, well let's, let's start tasting and I'll, I may have some questions along the way because sure. I, the first thought that I have in my head is, 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 am I ever having fresh olive oil in my home? If I'm getting something off a shelf at a, at a market, it's already older. It's already probably in, sometimes in a clear bottle. This and that. It's doing all the things that, you're, that we don't want to be doing uh, right. so, so I, maybe I've never had freshly pressed olive oil before. Well, let's see. And let's make sure that I bet you're going to have some right now. Right. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, so what I've, so I've sent you ahead, you know, a little bottle of some of our, you know, fresh olive oil, which we've, you know, harvested in the fall yep. and we're using a cup to taste it. And so we're using, you know, it's a clear cup with a lid. You know, if you're at home or if you're in your kitchen, kind of at your restaurant, you know, you can use whatever's available. A shot glass totally works. A wine glass, you know, these little kind of plastic ramekins work well. And so what we have is a cup so that it fits into the palm of our hand. And then we also have a lid and there's a reason for that, which you can also kind of just cover it with your hand. But basically when we're tasting an olive oil, we want to kind of perceive the aromas and the flavor of it. And what we're doing is we're thinking back to that equation of kind of the freshness and that we really first 
want to capture those aromas of that fresh fall harvest fruit. So that's kind of what we're looking for first. So when we're gonna taste it, I'll swirl this cup in my palm. While you're doing your swirling, I'm gonna do the same thing at home. I'm gonna be, you know, uh, matching what you're doing. So I'm swirling it and rubbing it against my palm to, what, to bring a little warmth to it. Exactly, yeah. What we're doing is we're using our body heat okay. and that's helping that olive oil to bloom and kind of open up and release more of those aromas, which then we're, that's why we have the lid or that's why we have our hand, you know, over the top of this cup is it's keeping those aromas in. So then when we're ready to smell it, we get this burst of that so, first. Kind for of those of you who are watching or listening, uh, I vicariously, I'm going to try to share my experience with you so that you know what I'm going through. And then you can contact Lisa so you can go through this directly yourself. Exactly. Also, and I mean, some oils at home. You know, if you're at home, if you're in a kitchen, just grab any olive oil that's handy, you know, and just kind of follow along and we'll describe what we're looking for just see if you're kind of picking up something simpler, similar in the oil that you have available. Okay. I'm so I'm going to go ahead and the, smell. Take off the lid and put my nose yeah. right in. And so I'm going to take off the lid and I'm going to hold the cup right up to my nose and I'm going to inhale deeply. And I'm oh. going to think about kind of what I'm smelling here. Uh, and yeah. like when I smell this oil, I mean, I'm, I'm immediately kind of translated, kind of transmitted outside into like the garden or it's almost as if I'm kind of walking through those fields, right? Because this is like, when we're talking about that the oil is the juice of the fruit, we're capturing all those aromatics from the fruit. That's what we're smelling here. This is what we'll call like the fruitiness of an olive oil. And Very it should be complex. something fresh, something green, something vibrant, right? That's like something that would grow in the garden, whether it's kind of grass, yeah. herbs, fruits, or vegetables. Definitely getting green right off the bat and, and herbaceous and almost I'm even getting a little uh, uh, peppery for sure and there's kind of like I really kind of pick up some tomato in this oil that's kind of yeah, like a yeah. real fresh almost like the vine on a tomato and I mean like this oil that we're tasting specifically you know it's a blend of three of the varietals that we make you know so we're picking up little nuances from those different olives yeah, yeah. any oil to know that it's fresh in general you just want this bright green burst of that fruitiness kind of coming through initially on the nose when you That's smell just it. Because as you, as you apply words to these uh, aromas and, 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 and name them, then, then it starts to make sense because you smell it, you don't, and, and this is like what you do with wine tasting as well as you are looking for the, the berries or the, or the melon or the this or that. And, and so, but we don't always have the vocabulary yeah. to connect the dots. So, so what you're doing is connecting those dots. And as you said, tomato, then I went, oh, that's the, that's what I just picked up. Totally. And this is why it's so much more fun to taste. I don't know if um, if you've ever sat at home tasting olive oils or tasting wine and then tasted in a group. It's like, I always appreciate tasting with someone else because it's like half the time you're like, I, I know what that is, but I can't put my finger on it. And then somebody says, you know, oh, oh. melon. Yeah, go, yeah. But why, for those who are doing it alone, when, when you sent me the kit with the oils, you also have a little booklet that helps you to, to start making notes and you start to I write these things down so that, you can create your own, each person can create their own uh, equivalencies, a language equivalent right. and, right. and analogies and association. And, and you can kind of think about it, you know, there's sort of like some descriptors that are commonly found and commonly used, like, you know, maybe green banana, you know, green apple, almond, things like that. But, you know, really like the world is your oyster, kind of depending on what you eat and depending on what you might kind of recognize in an olive oil, it can really depend. Like part of my background is I used to work with a sensory panel for olive oil and they were always calling out like notes of green tea in olive oils. I didn't drink any green tea. So it was kind of like, I was always searching for this green right. tea. <laughs> it's like, I'm never going to find it until I recognize what green tea kind of has. Green tea, yeah. I do the yeah. same thing with wines. I'm always looking for the cherries, the, cher the cherry, yeah. the, 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 the Bing cherry flavor, you know? And, yes. and it took me a long time to find out where, where it was and which wines had it. Right, because those Bing cherries, you know, they're not always readily available. <laughs> so yeah, so kind of back to this oil that we're tasting, kind of the freshness. Yeah. We've got kind of this first burst. That's our first clue that we have a fresh oil. And that's what we want kind of in any olive oil is that kind of fruitiness right on the nose. So then let's go ahead and taste it. And so hey, something is all You just said something. There. Does that mean that if I'm, if the oil's not so fresh, then I'm going to notice, I'm not going to get that burst of of uh, verdancy that I got from this one. That's right. Yeah, you won't. 
you'll basically find that there's almost no aroma. So it's pretty flat. And that's kind of showing that it, you know, the oil could potentially be old and it's starting to oxidize and starting to turn rancid. Or you could kind of pick up some other aromas, which are aromas that translate to something that's we're not looking for in all of it. The most common thing, like, you know, in the US, we haven't had a traditional source of fresh olive oil. So like largely, you know, what I recognize as olive oil until I kind of fell into this industry was oil that was made from fruit that was much, much overripe by the time it was harvested and made. And so that fruit is rotting and it's fermenting. And so those oils, when you smell them, sometimes it's more of like a briny kind of a black olive or almost like a harsher kind of chemical acetone yeah. sort of kind of aroma so anything like that is not what we want and that's well, I'm glad you said all that because uh, after we get through this one and i get the gold standard so to speak that I, I brought one from my kitchen in that i want to uh do the same test to and see if see how different it is just kind of uh, see what it i know that that oil is definitely not new you know not fresh right, right well, so i haven't gotten to the tasting part there should it keeps- yeah so when we're tasting it so we're actually going to take a sip but we're also going to suck in air as we're tasting it for a couple reasons. It helps the oil to emulsify on your palate to, so that we can kind of taste the whole flavor. And it's also, as we're doing that, we're also kind of forcing some of those aromas up into our nose as well as our palate. Cause a lot of these fruitiness and the flavor we're getting kind of the aromatics and we're getting the texture and the flavor on our tongue. So, so you it's about the olfactory experience exactly. we were talking earlier about that we experience taste and flavor, but 80% olfactory and maybe 20% on the actual tongue itself. Exactly. So we can go ahead and taste it and pay attention to what you're tasting and also the texture. Mm, mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm slurping, I'm, sip, I'm, I'm hissing in air and, and, uh, and again, the flavors are changing right in my mouth as I, and, and in my, not just my mouth, but up in my sinus cavities as I'm, as I'm breathing it in. Yeah. And I mean, like, so I'm tasting like even more of that fruit that we kind of were getting that first burst when we smelled the aromas, I'm getting more kind of notes of like a green banana now, you know, it's really kind of coating my tongue. And then do you notice like a little bit of a finish in the back of your throat, Peter? Yes. It's kind of a little bit of a tickle kind of, and a yeah. little bit of a bite. Yeah. And so it's like the texture I just took a sip of olive oil, you know, so it coats my mouth, but we want the oil to know that it's fresh. We want the oil to feel clean after the fact that it's not kind of sitting and coating the palate and the finish moves into the back of your throat. And that's kind of where we get a little bit of this peppery sensation. And that peppery is kind of something else that we're looking for as an indicator that that olive oil is fresh because that's coming from these antioxidants that are naturally occurring in those olives. And when we're harvesting those olives early in the fall, kind of when they're at their peak, when they're kind of more green, just starting to turn to violet, that's when the olive has the highest count of those polyphenols. And so that translates naturally into the olive oil, into that kind of peppery sensation, which, you know, the first time I experienced that, I thought something was maybe arrived. That that never happened to me. I thought, is there something wrong? And I realized um, it's supposed to be that's the good sign, you know? That's a good sign, right? Because once those polyphenols, you know, they make the olive oil super healthy, they also protect, you know, the flavor and the structure of that olive oil. So like if an olive oil is no longer fresh or it's been compromised because it's been sitting open too long, you know, next to a heat source, we'll lose those antioxidants and those will fade and we'll no longer have that peppery kind of sensation. So it's a way that we know also that when we're tasting it, that it's, it's still a fresh oil. And, but you're right too that that my mouth still feels clean. The, the flavors the the flavor has moved to the back of my palate and, mm-hmm. and to that peppery zone, so to speak. But the rest of my palate feels really kind of refreshed. Like I just almost just you know like I don't want to compare it to mouthwash, but I like my 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 breath is clean and pure. And it, it you can fun. use the olive oil as mouthwash. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah. That could be another thing. Could be on there. But no, the, I think that's that almost like the chlorophyll. The 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 green grassy aspect right it's kind of invigorating. it's almost like yeah it is like chewing double mint gum <laughs> exactly and i mean that's the biggest thing to remember is like you know any oil like you should be able to perceive the aromas with this kind of fresh fruitiness 
the texture should be clean and there'll be some intensity of that pepper, you know, which will vary oil to oil, depending on what oil you're using. You know, we're making a flavor profile that we want to be really fruit forward and kind of versatile in the kitchen because we work primarily with chefs. So we want to have an oil that can kind of pair with your vegetables and your fish just as much as it can pair with, you know, your meats and things like that. But, you know, this is where, you know, we just want to make sure with any olive oil, we have fresh olive oil as kind of our starting point. And then we can kind of think about all of the nuances and things that, you know, are going to pair into our dish. So, yeah. So um, I'm getting all of that freshness. Now I've got this other, this other olive oil that I brought in from my kitchen. I wanted to see from a comparison standpoint, because I think contrast sure. these things is really helpful. And I know in the kit that you send, you give uh, four different oils so that people can do these, con you know, tasting, contrasting. We're not going to do all that in this session. And so I'm substituting for some of your, the other oils you send me, um, one from my kitchen, which I, and again, I call it, it's labeled as a Kalamata olive oil, whatever that means. Um, and, and it usually has a bold flavor and I always like it in food. And so I'm going to do what I did, did what, you, what you just showed me to do. I'm going to kind of warm it up in my palm, mm -hmm. pick it up a little bit, and um, see if I can release some of those aromatics, if there's any left. Totally, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. I, said, I have no idea how long it took that oil to get from, from uh, Greece to Trader Joe's, from, and then from Trader Joe's, how long it sat there before it made it to my shelf. And, and then and I'm at the bottom of a bottle, so even, even if I had just gotten it, I've, it's still probably a few weeks old. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and release the lid now. If I can. Yeah, it's it's pleasant, but it doesn't blow, you know, like be, the first time I got this bouquet of, this is, it's it's shallower. It, it releases and it goes away. It doesn't right. have a little that, bit subtler. Yeah, and it doesn't have yeah, the complexity and the depth of the other and that be, could be you know like as an olive oil kind of ages you know like fresh we want to start out fresh and we want to keep it fresh right any olive oil will kind of slowly oxidize over time you know and so part of that process if it's part way through and maybe it's not 100 percent rancid quite yet you'll get you'll notice that those aromatics as long as they're fruity you know we know it was made from a green olive to begin with but they'll begin to fade before you know when it oil fully oxidizes, you're not going to get those aromatics. And then in other senses, sometimes we get aromatics that are coming not even from the fruit, from other things. Right. So even from the best of the olive oil, if it's not as fresh, it's not going to be as good as when you, when it was fresh. But then you've got the other factors that are, when was it harvested? Was it, was it in a sense, diminished from the beginning as opposed to maximize the right. beginning? Right. It's kind of like we need to start fresh and then we need to keep it fresh. Yeah. Give it, okay. I've, did, I've warmed it up again. I've cleansed my palate with a cracker. I'm going to go ahead and taste it now and see okay. if how it's different. Oh, totally different experience. It's, first of all, there's not much complexity of flavor. There's one little burst of flavor. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like it's coating my tongue. Really? Yeah. Um, I'm not getting any, well, it's a little, I'll give it time. There's a slight bit of the peppery quality that you talked about, but not much. Uh, yeah, it just feels flatter. I guess that's the best uh, word. Yeah, I would say that's a great description as you just okay. lose this dimension. Like I think of it as like, you want an olive oil to kind of dance in your mouth. You know what yeah. I mean? You want to be taken through this ride, you know, where we're smelling yeah. it and then we're tasting all these other aspects and then we're finishing with this pepper. Yeah. And as an oil, you know, begins to oxidize or if it's already rancid, we lose all of those notes and it becomes very flat and it becomes heavier. I mean, the biggest indication if an oil has become rancid is the texture. That's kind of the first indication. And that's, you'll notice is like, you know, when we're talking about a fresh oil is very clean, you know, you're going to taste the opposite of an oil is not fresh. It's going to feel really heavy, like you were describing, kind of greasy, and it lingers. It kind of stays around, and you may be getting starting some of those flavors of rancidity, which stick with you because it kind of has that thicker texture, uh -huh. which tastes yeah. kind of like waxy crayons or like wet cardboard or you know if we've ever had stale walnuts those are things that we don't want in an oil that show that it's you know it's gone rancid well fortunately um it didn't it, it well it's ne not nearly as vibrant as the first one it does mm -hmm. i'm not getting too many of the negative i'm getting diminished flavor but not necessarily what i associate with rancidity like off flavors or 
and you know or anything that so maybe it's not this oil maybe it wasn't as old or maybe it was harvested at a better time i don't know well one question i'd have is like so part of what we're looking for is kind of what is the flavor from how it was harvested but how is it stored you know because that's the other big question that we all need to ask you know that's a good question because it came in a dark green bottle and, mm -hmm. and so i guess it was protected somewhat from light and mm -hmm. this goes back to what david was talking about earlier too is is you know sort of the fact that he's got these these incredible tanks behind him or uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, are they kegs? What's the term that you use? <laughs> casks, casks of olive oil, but they're look like they're stainless steel um, and no lights getting at to the oil, right? And that's that's what you want. You don't want the light to somehow light will start that oxidation process, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, so, you know. Do you, uh, to give you a quick visual of what they look like. You know, the, the, the reality of the situation is, and I, and I want to say this because I don't want to make my job sound too easy, but making <laughs> olive oil when you start with good fruit is the easy part. Honestly, the hardest part at the end of the day is making sure that we're, that, that as producers, all of us, that we can get fresh oil to our customers. Because, you know, it's one thing when it's here in stainless steel, kept under nitrogen, so there's no oxygen. This is a climate controlled cellar. I I can protect the oil here, but once it moves into the real world, you know, all bets are off, right? It's, it, right. it could be in a warehouse, it could be in a grocery store shelf. So, you know, yeah. the reality is that once it leaves here, you know, my job continues because, I, you know, if I'm selling Peter Reinhardt oil, I want to make sure it's fresh, right? And so, you know, we have to think the process all the way through to the shelf and all the way through to the kitchen. Yeah. And, uh, and in some ways, you know, it's again, very different from wine where sometimes longer in the bottle is good. You want the, it takes time for all those flavors to emerge where with oil sooner is better. So, That's right. Yeah. It, it's juice. I mean, think of it like juice. Yeah, it, like, yeah, exactly. Well, this has been illuminating and, uh, you know, exciting. And again, I want to remind everyone who's listening or watching that you can, it doesn't have to be vicarious for you. You should contact uh, Lisa at uh, Corto. Uh, and uh, or, or is it through the website? Best way to read them is through the website. If you go to the website, so it's Corto, C O R T O hyphen olive.com, scroll to the bottom and you can. It's right now it's just open to kind of chefs and restaurants and basically you can sign up for we'll send you a kit and we'll set up a session for a one on one kind of tasting through and talking about, you know, having the experience of tasting and recognizing that fresh olive oil. And that's the biggest thing is like taste your olive oil at every opportunity and kind of continue good and bad right because we learn things from both of them. And it's really, you know tasting first that flavor of the fruit that it was harvested in the fall to kind of capture that flavor and then that it's also been protected from light air and heat by kind of looking at how the oil is packaged and kind of thinking about where it came from and kind of how it was treated throughout that process. David, you're in the cask room and I know when I go to a winery and I walk through the cask room, I mean part of the experience of taking a wine tour is the aromas and the aromasticity of, of what what what's it smell like? What, what are the aromas like where when you're surrounded by casts of olive oil, or are they so protected that you're not getting any of that uh, aroma? Yeah, great question. So I don't get any aroma, and there's a good reason for that. So we, you know, we used to, we all know now that light, heat, and air are the enemies of olive oil. And one of the ways we keep the air away is to inject nitrogen into the casks. And we used to bubble it through the oil uh, to, to get it up into the head space, and it would protect and kind of uh -huh. capsulate the, uh, the oil. But what we found was that the cellar room smelled really good when we did that. And it occurred to us that when we were doing that, we were losing a lot of the valuable aromas that we you know, worked so hard during the harvest to get into our oil. So we've changed our procedures now and we're able to uh, keep them all sealed and captured in, in the <laughs> oil. And that, a friend of mine exactly. calls that uh, volatizing the aromasticity. It was, it was, exactly. You're giving it away for free, you know, and, and, and That's right. it's, it's great when you're walking through, but how many of your customers are going to get to walk through the cat's room like that? Right. And David, guys, do you have, I just wanted to ask, David, do you have um, the packaging handy just to kind of show, oh, yeah, I do. you know, how the oil comes to the kitchen? Yeah, because it's, yeah, what, yeah, because how do you package it is a big question. You, this is something else that we don't talk about a lot is, you know, we, we, we now know light, heat, and air are the, uh, are the enemies of, of, fresh, of fresh oil, right? 
And the, the reality, and there are numerous shelf life studies that show this, the best package actually to keep fresh products fresh, not just oils, but juices, wines even, is actually Bag and Box. Because really? Bag and Box does exactly what we do here in the cellar. Light can't penetrate. It has a bag that collapses as you dispense it. So air never hits the product. Uh -huh. And the cardboard uh -huh. can actually act as an insulator as well. So yeah, it is, it is a, the only way I would, if, if I'm trying to sell Peter Reinhardt fresh oil, it's the only way I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> well, now that, so, so what about people who want to get it? Is, is it sold only to the industry now? Is it food service or is it consumer? Uh, is it a consumer product or, you know, how widespread is it? So the yeah, so ball, we, we, you know, we are, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Debbie. Lisa. You have a delay, so I wasn't sure. So Debbie, continue on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, our, our bread and butter is food service. We, we, we are a, a chef driven company. We, we sell to chefs. We work with chefs. That's what we do. But um, we have uh, made our oils available in uh, on our website. So, you know, in smaller packages for, um, for everybody, you can just go to the website and buy there. When you when so when you said when when the room was filled up with the uh, the nitrogen released aromas, um, what was what was that like? What was that? What was that? I mean, I got my my hit off of smelling from the cup. Was it just like that magnified, uh, or what? Yeah, you know, it, it, one of the best ways to know the quality of an oil that's coming out is the smell when the olives are being crushed. Right? Uh -huh. That releases a lot of aromas. Yeah. That smell is what we're trying to get to you, right? So we can we want to make sure we can smell that in the cup. Yeah. So yeah. the the cellar smelled like that. <laughs> so so that bouquet is coming to you, uh, you know, in the in the in the box of bag and in your little cup when you use it, and uh, uh, a lot to take with us now. For those of you again, uh, hopefully from what we talked about already should change the way you perceive the oils that you're using uh, and what you should be looking for. And maybe over the next couple of years as the education process sort of unfolds for the general consumer public, the, the people are gonna demand this and they're gonna to start, to get, to start, start to get as snobby about olive oil as they do about wine. And, uh, you know, it, it, and that would be a good thing because- That's it can, what we can all just, you know, take a rest. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, people are in the Lodi area. Can they, do you do tours or anything like that at the, you know, at the, uh, at the mill? Uh, you know, we're not really open to the public, but we do do we do do tours for chefs if they contact us. Again, uh, probably yeah. website or reach out to a, yeah. to yeah. one of your local. Rest. No, and you don't have a taste <laughs> open to the VIP public. Like Peter. <laughs> <laughs> all right well we're gonna we definitely want to come out there i want to get our whole pizza quest crew to come out with cameras and everything and really you know yeah. dive into it with you and, and take an olive oil bath with you but uh, <laughs> uh at least uh, david thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge and for all the work that you're doing to help elevate uh not only this sector of the of the industry but to bring great flavor you know to 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 the populace and we look forward to growing always fun to chat with you and thank you so much you know for inviting us on this is our pleasure really it's an honor well we look forward to seeing you and of course uh probably we'll see you uh when the next pizza expo happens right. when we actually can do a live one and not just a virtual one uh exactly. and, and uh who knows when all that will happen but until then at least you know we have these memories to share and and, and these aromas and flavors so thank you again and uh, keep up the great work and we'll see you you know, down the road for sure. And all of you, uh, thank you for joining us. And don't forget to check out the Cordo website. You can see all these visuals. You can send for, uh, you know, arrange with Lisa to, to get a, a, a real tasting and, uh, and just keep coming back here to Pizza Quest. We have a lot more to share with you over the next few months. Thanks. Bye-bye.